Thank you everyone for telling us in the chat where you're coming from. Uh, my name is Arthur Samuelson and I am speaking to you from Western Massachusetts, um, one of the more beautiful parts of this beautiful state. Um, I'm the program director at the, at the Royal Conference Center um, and we are thrilled and delighted to be your host um, for Mark's program um, tonight. Um, how many of you have been to us before? Um, okay, well, we hope to see you back and we hope to see those of you who have never been to us because we're in a very beautiful part of the state, surrounded by trees and um, a place where people can actually think because we don't have cell service. Um, we have Wi-Fi. Uh, we've been there for almost 100 years. In 2024, it'll be the 100th anniversary of our summer camps. Since 1974, <clears throat> we've been running weekend workshops like the one that tonight uh, on spirituality, personal growth, all the creative arts, nature, communication, and social change, all things that we believe go into making for a flourishing life. Um, of course, these last two years, we've had to learn how to do things we've never done before um, and to, to do this online and in the process have discovered that we can do things we couldn't do before and reach pe people we could not do before. And um, it's been really exciting. But we've also missed seeing people come to our beautiful center. Um, we are now slowly reopening. Uh, we have been in, in the past, we've done two or three weekend programs um, and we'll be doing one a weekend until things start picking up. Um, um, we have made all sorts of changes to the facility to accommodate, um, to, to uh, take into consideration um, the pandemic and uh, we require anyone to come on our site, on our um, on our site to be to be vaccinated and and actually take a uh, COVID test within three days of arriving. So we have done everything we can to keep people safe, and um, we look forward to uh, perhaps seeing you. Mark um, is going to be offering a, a weekend workshop with us in October. Um, that he's going to tell you a little bit about. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Mark is a writer and a scholar, a teacher and an award-winning poet, translator of German poets such as Meister Eckhart and Rilke. He's got a bunch of books coming up, one on Rilke called A, w a Wiser Way, Living Your Deepest Questions with Rennie Maria Rilke. And there's a translations of a collection of poems, Hilda Doman, and, and poems that uh, Mark has written inspired by Meister Eckhart. And he's going to be speaking to us from Camden, Maine. So we are delighted to have you back, um, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur. And thanks, Fia, for doing all the background work. It's a delight to be back with many of you, familiar faces, or at least familiar names if your video isn't on, and to be able to welcome uh, many of you whom I don't know and probably who don't know me yet. So this is really a, a short evening, uh, a quiet, reflective gathering to explore something of the remarkable witness, poetic witness of Rainer Maria Rilke a German-speaking poet who was born in Prague, what was then the province of Bohemia in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, and really understood himself as a European in a way that is still possible to do in Europe today. Although he understood his identity through the German language, he was not German and uh, suffered greatly uh, under the terror of German politics, particularly the First World War, which we may talk about briefly tonight. So tonight is a chance to explore 
the question of journeying by heart. And as author mentioned, I'll be spending a weekend, the 28th to the 30th of October at the Rose Center to go deeper into these, that question, the heart's journey. We'll do it through the, through the windows of Meister Eckhart and Julian of Norwich, two medieval mystics who are separated from each other by a century, but shared a similar kind of passionate vision, unitive vision of mm -hmm. how one might live in a more sane and responsible way in one's life. I think we, it's called mystical healing paths in ordinary life, a contemplative retreat. So if you'd like more information about that, do be in touch with Arthur uh, or the center, or you can contact me through my website, which you can find pretty easily by doing a, a web search, msburrows.com. So tonight I'd like to, we're gonna do, um, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint with you. Journeying by heart, Rainer Maria Rilke on solitude and intimacy. And it's strange to be speaking about solitude as we are, as we almost have to at this point, having been through two and a half years of a viral pandemic that has reshaped, interrupted, and reshaped all of our lives in ways we could never have imagined. Uh, and some ways we probably continue to resist. It did open opportunities for us to dwell within ourselves. And that's not always an easy invitation to dwell in ourselves, to become acquainted with ourselves. And that dynamic, the importance of that discovery, that journey of self-discovery, and the difficulties that our lives push before us, that resist that, will be woven through my reflections tonight. I'll talk for about 50 minutes. We'll have a time, a short time for breakout groups, about 20 minutes, and then uh, a wrap up in the last 10 minutes. So this is a journey by heart. I wanna begin with the German word Einsamkeit. Some of you will know some German, perhaps enough to understand the word, that the heart is the root Einsam, which simply means alone. If I'm Einsam, I'm alone, but it has the overtone of lonely. Einsamkeit could be translated as loneliness but it could also be translated as solitude and is often translated as solitude. I'm a translator of Rilke, among other German writers. And that word presents a remarkable challenge because loneliness and solitude are very different experiences of our aloneness. One is a terribly fraught experience, a dark experience, a difficult experience, Solitude, I suspect for most of us, has a positive ring to it, a more open sense of how we dwell in our own lives, in the places where we live. And I'd like to explore this double meaning throughout this evening to help us come to understand how solitude can be, I think, a pathway into an intimacy with ourselves, with those around us, and with the, the natural world of which we are a part. So Rilke begins one of his best known poems with this line, my life is not this steep hour in which you see me hurrying so. And I'd like to begin with two passages from Rilke's poetry. This poem, which describes our need to stand aside from the rush, from the hurry, from the panic that is so much of our, our mechanized culture. For me, at least, and perhaps for you, the first year and a half, particularly of the pandemic, meant that I went nowhere, that I stayed pretty much at home. 
And I live in a beautiful part of the world where that was hardly difficult to do. But the aloneness was not always easy. And as soon as the prospect came that we could begin to travel again, I found myself at first reluctantly uh, and yet eagerly stepping back into the world of speed, not always happily, I should add. This poem Rilke wrote in 1899, just at the point where the, the engine-driven culture was taking a strong leap forward. My life is not this steep hour in which you see me hurrying so. I'm a tree standing before what I once was, a marvelous image to imagine yourself as a tree deeply rooted in place before what I once was perhaps hurrying about. I am only one of my many mouths. And at that, the first to close. Rilke uses this image in several of his early poems and in the single novel that he wrote to talk about how we have many mouths or many faces, the face that we present to our most intimate friends, the face or the mouth that we present to coworkers, the face or the mouth that we present to strangers whom we don't know, the face we present to those we're afraid of, that our faces, our mouths have so many different postures. And Rilke in this poem is sure that at the deepest point, his identity is with a, a mouth that knows to close, a mouth that knows to stop speaking and to listen. And here it comes then, I am the stillness between two notes that don't easily harmonize because the note death wants to lift itself up. But in the dark interval, both come trembling to join as one. And the song abides beautiful. There's so much in this poem. We could spend the entire evening with this poem. We could spend a weekend together exploring dimensions of this poem. This sense that, that, that our life is like a stillness between two notes, two musical notes that don't harmonize with each other, that are discordant. Because, you know, death, he says, wants to lift itself up. Over what? Over life, over love, over joy, over kindness, over generosity. And our life, it, if it is that stillness, it's a dark interval. It's not a bright place necessarily. It's a dark interval in which we sense an abiding song. The last half line reads simply in German, und das Lied bleibt schön. The song stays, remains, abides, beautiful. So I'd like to begin with this as one of the bookends of this evening's brief retreat together. This sense that in the, amid the panic of our life, amid the hurry and the worry that does shape so much of our consciousness, there's something else, this deep unconscious stillness that we yearn to know about, that we desire to become more closely open to, attentive to. And in that stillness, in that dark interval, we come to sense Rilke surmises something of the song. We catch some melody of this song that continues on, that sings us in the deepest silences of our souls. And it's beautiful. So that first is one bookend and here's another. That was a, an early poem of Rilke's, 1899. This one comes from near the end of his life. He died at 51, but he wrote these poems in 1922. 
He was 47 years old. And he finished the end of the great eighth of the 10 Duino elegies with this vivid image. And we spectators always, everywhere, turned toward everything and never looking out from within. That's a phrase, by the way, never looking out from within, that the remarkable writer, Eddie Hillisum, explored in her journals written just before the end of her life when she was taken to Auschwitz and eventually murdered there. But in those remarkable journals, a section of which were translated as an interrupted life, she muses about that word of Rilke's. In fact, she tells us she only was going to take a few books with her to the camp on the way to Auschwitz. And one of them was the book of poems from which we just heard one of the poems, um, My Life Is Not This Steep Hour. And the other was a small pocket Bible. And we spectators always everywhere turn toward everything and never looking out from within, never looking out of things from within them. All this fills us to overflowing. We arrange it. It falls apart. We rearrange it and fall apart ourselves. Who has turned us around so that no matter what we do, we assume the posture of one who is always departing? What a question. What a question. Who has turned you around? Who has turned me around? So that no, no matter what I do, no matter what you do, we so often assume the posture of one who's about to leave and not committed to stay. That's the restlessness of our society. And I feel at least, and perhaps you do as well, that after this long period of quiet, of a lack of motion, we find ourselves, in one sense, drawn back, not pushed, but drawn back into this speed of our lives. And we sense that it's not necessarily going to be an easy, an easy journey. But how do we live differently? So that we're not always those who are ready to leave, but those with the capacity to indwell one of Rilke's favorite words, to dwell in our own lives, to become more aware of who we are, to become more articulate about that stillness that is at the core of our often noisy lives. Now, Rilke, here's a painting made by the Russian painter whom Rilke met on his first trip to Russia in 1899. Leonid Pasternak, you see the Kremlin, the old walled city uh, of Moscow in the background, where he met Pasternak, the father of the great poet Boris Pasternak. That's an image from that early poem. That was Rilke in 1899 when he wrote that first poem we heard, and this is Rilke of the Duino Elegies, a photograph taken just a few years before his death, probably the year that the Elegies were finished, 1922. And if you see that image as I do, the eyes are haunting, aren't they? Piercing. Those who met Rilke often commented in their letters, in their comments about him, the reflections about the experience of how present he was, how piercing, how penetrating his gaze was, how deep his eyes were, his light hazel eyes. This is an image from a place Rilke moved to in 1900, just after that poem was written in the north of Germany. The landscape suited him. The landscape felt to him like a place of solitude of Einsamkeit. Here in this great painting by Otto Modazon, 
Umroka knew. He lived in an artist community in Vorpsvede for a little over a year. Here's another image of some farmers uh, working in the fields along the canals. You sense the wideness of the horizon, the vastness of the sky, and in a sense, the smallness of these individual characters, that we belong to this immense world and that we're part of that immensity. This is what Rilke saw throughout his whole life to help us understand that we're not simply small creatures lost in insignificance. No, we, we take the immensity of that world into ourselves through our experience of its grandeur, of its vastness, of its immensity. We'll be following those themes through this evening's talk. Now, the end uh, in, in 1912, Rilke visited this castle on the Adriatic, near near the city of Trieste, on the west, uh, uh, the eastern, eastern northeastern coast coastline of Italy. This is the Duino Castle, the Duino Palace, where Rilke, on a storm swept January night in 1912 was walking along these balustrades with a drop of some 600 feet to the ocean below. Here you see the old castle below. And there he heard what became the first line of the first elegy. That sense of being in the vastness of this life, of this world. And who he heard these words, and who, if I cried out, would hear me among the ranks of the angels? That became the first lines of the first elegy. Again, an image dealing with this sense of einsamkeit, as aloneness in that sense, right? As a sense of the terror of being alone in the force of nature against the forces of the world. So I'd like to hold those images of the vastness of that, those Northern um, moors near Vorpsvede, near Bremen, the city of Bremen, and the image of, uh, of Duino and of the first beginning of the first elegy before us. What I'd like to do with you today is to explore a theme that was central to Rilke, that this is Simone Weil. Some of you will know her writings. She was a close reader of Rilke, deeply influenced by him. And in one of her remarkable entries from an essay that came to be collected into a book called Waiting for God, she has this to say. We live in a world of unreality and dreams. To give up our imaginary position as a center, to renounce it, not only intellectually, but in the imaginative part of our soul, that means to awaken to what is real and eternal, to see the true light and hear the true silence. It is a transformation analogous to that which takes place in the dusk of evening on a road, where we suddenly discern as a tree what we had at first seen as a stooping person, or where we suddenly recognize as a rustling of leaves what we thought at first was whispering voices. We see the same colors, we hear the same sounds, but not in the same way. This was a thought central to Rilke's whole life's work. And it really comes down to his conviction that at the heart of our life is the energy of transformation, an energy that lies waiting for us to release it, to tap it, to activate it. We don't have to create it because our, our very bodies are being transformed constantly as cells replace cells. 
and as we grow and change. But he's interested in the deeper transformation of the heart, the transformation of the deepest wellspring of our life. And to enter into that sense of transformation, we're going to look over his shoulders for a few moments and look at four brief sections from letters he wrote to a young man, a young poet named Franz Kapus between the years 1903 and 1908. Now, Rilke was born in 1875, so he's only 28 years old when he writes the first of these letters to a poet who was only nine years his junior. But Kapus already acknowledged, Rilke was already acknowledged as a, as a European poet of note. And Kapus knew that. And it, he was at a military school, young Franz Kapus, and one of his teachers had been Rilke's teacher uh, at the school and noticed that Kapus was reading this book of poems, a youthful book of Rilke's poems, and, and uh, commented on this. And eventually Kapus had the courage to write to Rilke to send some poems and to ask him if he had what it took to be a writer. In the 10 letters that Rilke wrote back over this almost six year period, Rilke only begins by speaking about the call to be a writer. Mostly these are letters about the call to become more deeply human, to become who we are, to find the sources, the deepest sources of our spirit of our lives. In the very first letter, where Kapus had asked, had sent these letters and said, tell me if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a poet, if I have what it takes to be a poet. Rilke, a page and a half in, and these are long, some of these letters are four pages long, handwritten letters, has this to say, if you were in a prison whose walls let in none of the earth's sounds, wouldn't you still have your childhood with its precious kingly riches, this treasury of memories. Turn your attention to this. Try to lift up the sensations from your distant past. Your personality will be strengthened by this and your solitude, Einsamkeit, will expand itself, becoming a twilight dwelling in which the noise of others drifts above and beyond you. And if from this inner turning, this submerging into your own inner world, poems should come forth, it will no longer occur to you to ask someone else if they have any worth. Isn't that a remarkable moment in this first letter, the first of what would become 10, 10 letters of correspondence? Look into the depth of your life back into your childhood memories and seek in finding your roots, your origin, your early formation, a solitude and Einsamkeit that will expand itself, becoming a twilight dwelling in which the noise of others drifts above and beyond you. And if from this inner turning, the submerging into your own world, poems should come forth. It will no longer occur to you to ask someone else if they have worth. This for Rilke is the heart of what Einsamkeit offers us, offers us, doesn't force on us. Einsamkeit can lead to terrible bereftness, terrible abandonment, a terrible sense of alienation and inner turmoil. Or it can be the place where we come to find our deepest voice. And for Rilke, that had everything to do with finding a way of coming back to our childhood, and discovering those that, that life of first discoveries that each of us experienced as children. Later in that same year, he returns to the same theme of solitude. 
and writes this, think of the world you carry within yourself. This is the, uh, the fullness of solitude. Think of the world you carry within yourself and call this way of thinking in any way you wish. Whether this comes as memories of your childhood or as a yearning for your own future, pay close attention to what arises within you and attend to this above all else you notice around you. For your inner life is worth all your devotion. Devote yourself to it. Do not squander too much time in clarifying your relationship with others. I was amused to discover, uh, one of you actually brought this to my attention. There's a new translation of the Letters to a Young Poet by uh, Anita Barrows and Joanna Macy. And they've taken out many of the sections on solitude and aloneness because they felt that they were just too distressing for modern people which may be true, it may say something about the culture in which we live. They felt that they were antisocial as well, and I don't think that's Rilke's point here. What he is saying is that if we don't know who we are, then our lives will be torn apart by trying to fit in to how others want us to be, who others want us to be, how they would like to relate to us, what they desire to find in us that if we don't devote ourselves to that inner core of who we are, then we will live restless and unfulfilled, unfulfilling lives. December, 1903. In the following May, don't let yourself go astray on account of your solitude. Simply because there is something within you that wishes to escape from it. And here I think the double entendre, solitude and loneliness is really at, 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 at full force. Because there is something in us that wants to escape that aloneness when it feels like loneliness. I mean, how do you do that? We, we rush out uh, to find community. We lose ourselves in the company of others. Nothing really wrong with that. But Rilke is exploring the patience it takes to stay on this heart journey to discover our deepest self. Precisely this wish, if you draw on it quietly and resolutely, as if you were using it as a tool, will help you expand your solitude across a wide horizon. So it's resisting the, the need or the wish, the desire to escape from our aloneness. People too often, with the help of conventions, resolve everything in the direction of what is easy, to the point of choosing the easiest side of ease. It's clear, however, that we must hold to what is most difficult. Everything living knows this truth. And that sense that solitude can be difficult is something I don't need to tell anybody, any of you about. You, you know the truth of that. You've experienced it over these recent years. The acute sense of frustration, of lostness, of regret that our lives have been interrupted and changed significantly. What do we do with that? How does that, that sense of aloneness become something like that vast ocean that Rilke is describing. So later, a few months later, the fourth time he speaks of solitude, when we speak again of solitude, it becomes ever clear that this is not something we can either choose or relinquish. We are alone. Wir sind allein. That's his emphasis. We are alone. One can deceive oneself about this and pretend that it is not so, but that's it. It's far better to recognize that we are so and then to begin from this point. And I think 
what I've learned, I've been reading these letters since I was about the age of Franz Kappa, was a few years younger, about 16 or 17. And I know many of you will know these letters yourself, and perhaps from an early age. These are letters that one can return to at any age to great profit. But there's something here that is so essential for Rilke and such an important reminder for us. It's not that we recognize that we are alone so that we can wallow in our aloneness. It's recognizing our aloneness so that we can discover ourselves and open ourselves, begin from this point to discover the aloneness that others carry within themselves, the loneliness of those around us, sometimes our most intimate friends who carry an aching sense of aloneness that they may have the courage to share with us or not. Well, that's the backdrop from the letters. I'd like to turn to a couple of poems and then we'll have a chance to speak with each other about this theme of solitude. And you can feel where this is going because Rilke at this point was emphasizing with this very young 19 year old poet at the beginning, um, 24 year, years old by the end of the correspondence, 25. This need to, to have the courage to stay alone, to discover who one is before squandering one, one's distinctiveness, the precious treasure that is each one of you, each one of us, that we might then share with others in our lives and in our world. One of the poems in that same early collection. So we'll look at a couple of early poems and a couple of late poems today. Is one that uh, I've always found hauntingly moving. I love the dark hours of my being. Ich liebe meines Wesens Dunkelstunden. I love, not that I tolerate or I have accommodated myself to these dark Hours and, and what does that conjure for you? The dark hours, the hours that are not brightly lit with happiness, with joy, with exuberance, with warmth, perhaps cold, difficult stretches of your life. And it's quite something to say, I love them. I must admit, those aren't the first words that spring to my mind when I found myself in very, very difficult places of abandonment, of rejection, of shame. Rilke is quite sure that there's something there that is so important for our becoming who we are. I love the dark hours of my being for they deepen my senses. They deepen my senses. So there's something, there's something so obvious about this. Uh, some years ago, I spent the last, well, much of the last decade teaching in Germany at a university, and I had a student who was completely blind. He didn't see anything, and I, I became quite close to this student. He was he was a remarkable young man, and um, he had a sense of things around him that I've never experienced with anybody, any of my sighted friends or acquaintances. He could hear me coming down the hallway in the university and 30 feet away, a crowd of people. And when I would approach him, he'd say, good morning, Dr. Burroughs. And I would ask him, how do you know that it's me? And he'd say, he'd smile and he would say, well, I know your footstep. In the darkness, we can attune ourselves. We can sharpen our senses. And so this is, on the physical sense, this is true, but Rilke is speaking of it also metaphorically. These dark hours deepen the inner sense of that we carry within us. In them, as in old letters, I find my daily life already lived. In these dark hours, like in old letters I've treasured, 
that I put in a box, that you've put in a box, and you, you bring out on the anniversary of your father's death or of a friend's, the loss of a friend. In them, as in old letters, I find my daily life already lived in holy words, so soft and subdued. From them, I've come to know that I have room for a second life, timeless and wide. That middle in the first version that he wrote, the version of 1899 that I published as Prayers of a Young Poet, these are poems that came to make up the very first part of the Book of Hours. So it's a three-part collection. And part one, he eventually called the Book of Monastic Life. But when he first wrote these 68 poems over a three-week period in the fall of 1899, having just returned from his first trip to Russia, to Moscow and St. Petersburg, he wrote these poems in Berlin, in the home of his lover, his beloved Lou, Andreas Salome. And there was something in his experience on, on that trip and in his experience of his first deep love that gave him a sense of the spaciousness of his life. That he wasn't trapped in a miserable childhood, which he often uh, gave witness to. He called it a long, terrible horror. That was his childhood. But there was something about coming back to that life and discovering that it wasn't finished. From these dark hours, I've come to know that I have room for a second life, timeless and wide. And at times I'm like the tree, ripe and rustling, standing above the dead boy's grave, gathering him in its warm roots, fulfilling the dream he'd lost in the sorrows and the songs. An image, probably, of Rilke describing himself again like a tree. In this image, a tree rooted on the top of a grave, and who's the dead boy in this grave? Probably Rilke's youth, this terrible youth that brought him so much suffering and fear. And that tree is gathering, gathering that youthful terror into its own roots and growing, growing that experience into something quite different, into what Rilke describes as a second life, timeless and wide. And I, I love that line. I, from them, I've come to know that I have room for a second life. I have space. I have a Raum for ein zweites Leben, sightless and bright. That's the German. I have space in my life for a second life. Something we probably never experience when everything is fine, when life is easy, when everything is going well. But when we find ourselves forced into these dark hours, forced into a darkness, perhaps that dark interval, that sense of despair, we have the chance to discover a spaciousness that was there all along, that only that sense of foreboding, that ominous sense, sometimes alerts us to. Well, a few years later in a letter of 1911, Rilke comes back to the theme of solitude, writing to a friend in Sweden, and says to be apart, that is fulfillment for us, to be integrated with our solitude into a state that can, that can be shared. And we're really going to kind of pivot or shift a little bit this evening, or this morning for those of you in Australia. Because in a sense, Rilke is beginning to discover himself after those youthful letters to a young poet, that in a sense, solitude is not simply meant for me, 
for us, for our own use. It opens us to a state that can be shared. It opens us to something that we hold in common with others. This treasury that each of us carries within ourselves and that, that we need each other. We find fulfillment in being a part, not a part, one word, a part, to be a part, to belong. That is fulfillment for us to be integrated with our solitude into a state that can be shared. What I'd like to do with you now, we'll do one poem from, one more poem from Rilke, and then we'll break into our groups for 20 minutes. And before we do that, um, Again, a journal entry. This is a young journal entry written even before the letters to a young poet. He's 23 years old when he writes this. Whether you're surrounded by the singing of a lamp or the sounds of a storm, by the breathing of the evening or the sighing of the sea, there's a vast melody woven of a thousand voices that never leaves you and only occasionally leaves leaves room for your solo. To know when you have to join in, that is the secret of your solitude, just as it is the art of true human interaction. To let yourself take leave of the lofty words, to join in the one shared melody. And this is just pure wisdom. I don't know how a 23-year-old can sense this, Although those who've suffered deeply as children, as young people, often have aptitudes of perception that far exceed those who've had an easier life. To know when you have to join in, not when you might join in. To know when you must join in, that's the secret of your solitude, just as, as it is the art of true human interaction. That's just good common sense and good relational sense. But this last line, to let yourself take leave of the lofty words, to forget about being eloquent, being special, being privileged, and to see that your solitude, your identity at the heart of who you are, is it's almost your vocation, I would say, to join in with the one shared melody. Not the solo voice that you you might occasionally bring into the chorus, he says there's not much room for that solo because there's a vast melody woven of a thousand voices that never leaves you, all of the voices that have shaped you in your life. But to, to give yourself permission to let go of the need to be special and to open yourself to join in the one shared melody, this is what our life Rilke felt, what the intimacy of our life is all about. We'll look at one last poem, and then we'll break into our groups for 20 minutes, and then come back for a brief conversation together before our time is over tonight. And this one comes, as I suggested, from one of the sonnets to Orpheus. It's from the first cycle the 19th sonnet. These are 55 sonnets that Rilke wrote in 1922. They came as he was finishing the elegies, the Duino elegies, begun in that dramatic um, castle, palace, situated high above a cliff on the Adriatic. And he finished them in the solitude of a castle tower he called Muzot, my chateau, Muzot, in the Valais part of Switzerland, the French-speaking part of Switzerland. That's where he spent the last almost five years of his life, and it's where near, near there is where he died and is buried. Though the world changes as swiftly as the drifting clouds, here's that theme again of speed, of pressure, 
of change, of action, of movement. And we, we know that's true. We don't need Rilke to tell us that. But what a marvelous image he gives to see the world like the drifting clouds that are sweeping across the horizon, changing shapes as they go. So the world changes as swiftly as the drifting clouds. All the toll comes home to what's more ancient still. There it is. This is a sonnet, so this is not the end of the poem, but it could be. What is whole? What's he talking about? All that's whole, all that has this sense of belonging. Not that's perfect, not all that's perfect, or all that's complete. All that's whole is something quite different. My blind, young blind friend, Mr. Schroeder, uh, we were, uh, he was taking a class with me on spirituality and we, one of the exercises was to do a walk in the woods together. And so we went out together as a group and we walked in the woods and he wanted to do this by himself in the middle of the night uh, later that week. And so he began calling taxi cabs to come at 1130 to take him to the forest and, and they would arrive and they'd see that he was blind and they'd not, they, they wouldn't do it. It took five cabs before finally somebody was willing. They probably feared that he was going to do himself harm or get lost in the woods. He just said he wanted to be in the forest at night. He wanted to sense that belonging to the whole that one finds in a dark woods in the middle of the night. All that's whole comes home to what's more ancient still. Beyond what changes and passes, Further than this and freer, your primal song endures. And here he's talking about Orpheus, about that song of love by which Orpheus wooed the creatures to attentiveness, to that sense of being part of the whole. And of course, by which he woos his departed Eurydice to rise up, to come up, from the dwelling place of the dead from Hades. Your primal song endures. God, Orpheus, playing upon the lyre. We've not grasped what suffering means, nor have we learned to love. And what distances us in death is not unveiled. Only the song drifting across the land, consecrates and celebrates. And there it is, the one shared melody. The song that drifts across the land, that consecrates the land, that celebrates the land, that consecrates your life and mine and celebrates our lives. And though we may not have understood anything about what suffering could ever mean, we who strive, struggle to bear it at best in its most difficult forms, and though we hardly learn to love in our lives, and though what we lose in death is not unveiled, remains veiled to us. There's so much we don't know. There's so much we can't understand. And yet here Rilke is inviting us, again, this is a poem about solitude. He doesn't use the word, but it's about that sense of something beyond the changes beyond the passing pressures of our lives, further than this and freer, that primal song that endures. What I'd like to invite us to do, we'll go into our groups for 20 minutes. It's a short time, there'll be three of you in a group. 
briefly introduce yourselves and reflect a little bit upon this theme of solitude, Einsamkeit, the difficult parts of it for you, the loneliness part for you perhaps, and that sense of being part of the whole, that sense of belonging, that sense of an intimate connection. So I'll see you in 20 minutes and we'll have a time to gather our thoughts in a final conversation together. Pass it over to you, Fia. Yes, I, people are moving around and dropping out. I will start it in a minute. And if you don't want to go in, um, I am likely to come find you if you're in a room alone and move you. So here we go. Well, welcome back to you all. I apologize that this is a rather short retreat. Everybody although... come back in about 45 seconds. Ah, uh, okay, I'll wait. Not quite yet. Thanks, Fia. Sure. Hi, Lisa. I see Lisa, two Lisas right next to each other. Hi. Twenty seconds. Okay. Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm sorry that that was a rather short time to really share on such a deep and stirring theme or themes, really. And I wonder, I wish I could have sat in on your conversations to overhear what, what you picked up along the way, how you explore this sense of Einsamkeit, of loneliness, solitude, and the role that that plays in your life now and perhaps through the period of the pandemic. These are themes we'll be exploring on a weekend together in late October. And those who are able to come to row, I would love to meet you there to have a more spacious time to reflect together to share our own experiences through the lens, the windows of Eckhart, Julian, and poets, modern poets, so stay tuned for that if you can come. I want to close with one more poem of, of Rilke's and let's see here. Here it is. I've just finished actually a translation I've been working on for much of the last six or seven years of the sonnets to Orpheus, Rilke wrote them in 10 days, 59 poems that really, 55 poems, excuse me, that really changed the, the shape of uh, poetic sensibilities in the German language and indeed in European languages. This was an event when they were published, written in 1922, published in 1923. There, there's an exuberance to them and uh, an energy, a passion to them that's just stunning uh, as a reader, but particularly as a translator trying to find and bring that urgency, that, that openness, that expansiveness from German into English. I'd like to close with one poem and a few final remarks before we bid each other adieu. It's the very last poem that he wrote in this cycle these sonnets to Orpheus. He addresses them to this God-like figure who straddles heaven and earth, who woos the natural world 
into to discover its harmony, the animals and the plants, and who brings Eurydice from the place of the dead back toward the earth, and then falters in the last moment. You, if you know the story from Ovid or from Greek antiquity, Hades, the god of the underworld, allows him to bring her, woo her back with song, playing his lyre and singing with one condition that he can't turn around uh, in doubt, because if he does, he'll lose her forever. And so she brings, she comes all the way up with her hand on his shoulder, often portrayed in the images that were created of this remarkable scene. And at the very last moment, he no longer feels her hand and he turns and she's gone forever. So these are poems written to this God-like figure who had such power and yet was so much like us, uh, faltering often at the moment when our trust fails us. So these are, these are the songs he writes to this poet. And this is the last one, quiet friend of many distances. Quiet friend of many distances. What is that line when you hear it, when you read it? What does that conjure for you to be a friend, not just of wideness, but of distances? Stiller Freund der vielen Fernen. Fühle wie dein Atom noch den Raum vermehrt. Quiet friend of many distances. And this is written to Orpheus, but it's written to you and to me in that stillness within us, when we can sense the expansiveness of our lives, of life itself. And when we discover how that expansiveness connects us with each other, it doesn't drive us away from each other, it, it, it binds us, it draws us toward each other, toward that expansiveness that each of us carries in varying amounts of awareness, right? That the only way that expansiveness can connect us is when we share it with each other, when that solitude becomes something that enlarges us together. Quiet friend of many distances, feel your breath, how it enlarges the room. What a marvelous image. Feel your breath. Have you ever imagined your breath enlarging the room as you breathe in right now? And you breathe out and something expands into the room. If there's someone sitting with you, that the air that you breathe out envelops them, surrounds them, and their breath enlarges that space where you sit quiet friend of many distances, feel your breath, how it enlarges the room. Let yourself ring out among the rafters of dark belfries. That which depletes you will become strong through this nourishing. That image, let yourself ring out like you're a bell among the rafters inside of towers, of church towers, belfries, right? That are dark. There you are, ringing out, letting your life ring out into the darkness. And the sound moving, obviously, out of that tower, into the world around, into the space around. As you do that, the things that deplete you will begin to become strong through this nourishing. Go forth within this change and come in again. And there's that word that Simon Weil saw as so central to Rilke, transformation, change. Our life is about change, about movement, about growth, about becoming. Go forth within this change and come in again within this change. What's your deepest experience of suffering? What a question. What a question. What is your deepest experience of suffering? If what, is, what you drink is bitter, become wine. Become something sweet. Become something delightful. 
become something precious. Oh, you will drink bitter things, and I will drink bitter things. But the choice to become bitter or remain bitter is ours. Or the choice to take that the bitterness of that of that mash of grapes and let it ferment and let it become wine. On this night, in this overflowing, be a magical power at the crossroad of your senses with all this strange encounter means. Marvelous, isn't it? I'll send all of you these poems so you'll have them after this retreat is uh, closed tomorrow. Or, or actually, Arthur and Fia will send these to you from me. On this night, in this overflowing, be a magical power at the crossroad of your senses with all this strange encounter means. And if what is, what is earthly has forgotten you, say to the quiet earth, I flow. To the rushing waters say, I am. So Roka ends with those words that are at the very heart of the ancient Hebrew tradition, the naming of God as the one who is who she is, I am who I am. That here Rilke, with that same sense of the power of that claim, invites us to enter into that Orphic song, into that song of Orpheus, to be who we are, and to understand that our life flows on, that our life, despite the suffering, that something is flowing in and through us, something binds us to a larger flow that weaves our life into the lives of those we love, those we care for, and those we worry about, those who love us, those who care for us, and those who worry for us. So this final poem of Rilke's invites us to sense how we are a part, a part of each other, a part of a flow that is larger than any one of us, that is deeper than anything we can ever understand, and that is faithful, that will not abandon us. To be a part, this is fulfillment for us. To be integrated with our solitude in a state that can be shared. I hope this little, this evening has given some glimpse of that to you through the marvelous wisdom and the eloquent writings of, of Rilke. Um, I would love to meet some of you at Rowe Center. It will be my first time there and perhaps for some of you as well. So be in touch with Arthur and Orfea at the center if you would like to know more about that or check my website. Or our, or our website, oh, rosecenter.org Rose Rose yeah. and the, the, yeah, URL, exactly. the URL for your program was posted in the chat. There we go. Thank well, you so thank much, y'all. Thank Back you, to you Mark. Mark. And I wish you all a good evening or a good morning those who are in Australia or elsewhere on that side of the world. And I hope we'll see each other very soon.